So good morning to all. Uh, it's uh, been really nice to be here. Uh, thanks to uh, Walt and uh, great support from uh, uh, Pushkarji. So uh, I'll be speaking on this uh, very interesting water system uh, uh, from the medieval times uh, uh, in India. Uh, this is uh, uh, one such photograph uh, of uh, the system that I am working in uh, Bidar. So the uh, presentation has been structured in such a manner that uh, one understands what the system is first and then we go on uh, to do uh, uh, a video uh, at the end uh, uh, which was done by the BBC, uh, a very short video. So we'll try to understand uh, what the history of uh, Kanad does, uh, uh, what the spatial distribution and geographical setting is. Uh, a little bit on classification uh, of Kanats in India, some character defining elements, how the uh, you know, systems are different from uh, different uh, from each other. And we'll discuss in detail on uh, the project that I'm working on uh, in Bidar and uh, we'll see a short video. So uh, what Kanat or uh, Kares is, the, uh, basically it's a uh, term that uh, uh, tries to define a channel or it's, it's a big Arabic word which, are, which is being used in Persian um, uh, from, for a long time now. So it either means a, a channel or a tunnel which is uh, uh, below the ground uh, to carry water. Right? Uh, it can be uh, shallow, it can be deep, deep enough to be below the uh, water table. So you'll find two terms which are commonly used in Persian region, one is the Kanat and the Kares, both the uh, nearly mean the same. Uh, Kares is more of a Persian word, the uh, Kanat is more of an Arabic word. Uh, and uh, we'll find uh, Kanats and as, as per the ICQHS data, this, this is uh, ICQHS's uh, uh, International Center for Kanat Hydraulic Systems which is located in uh, Tehran. It's a UNESCO body. Uh, they do a lot of research on, on uh, Kanats and do conservation activities in uh, within Iran basically. Um, so lots of uh, training programs etc are organized as well. So they look into uh, around 38,000 functional Kanat systems in Iran and uh, which supply uh, water to most of the cities, uh, especially in the drier belt, uh, uh, what called Daste Lut, Daste, Daste Kavir, you know, such, such kind of deserts, uh, uh, desertic environments as such. Uh, Yaz, Dia, uh, there are so many, so many cities that receive water from there. Uh, there, uh, and uh, you'll find uh, Kanats have spread uh, from uh, possibly from Persian region to uh, uh, rest of towards east as well as towards west. Uh, the uh, I'll, if I put into this map, so you'll find uh, it has gone across uh, uh, various places uh, from uh, uh, Persian region. So the origin is uh, slightly considered to be along the Persian as well as the Turkish border, where there were copper mines. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, documentation that has been done by Henry Gobault. So uh, he has written a paper in French, so I found it very difficult to get it translated, so somehow got it done. And then uh, I could understand that uh, uh, it is somewhere from there it has started. And uh, uh, towards east, uh, it has reached China and India, and uh, possibly through the migrations and uh, the connections uh, uh, India and uh, uh, Persia had and uh, probably through the uh, Silk Route to China. And towards east you will find uh, it has re uh, uh, towards west basically, uh, it has reached uh, uh, even the American continents uh, and uh, possibly the, it, it was the Spaniards who took uh, it to uh, the uh, South America as well as North America. Uh, I'm not sure where exactly in North America it is there because there are no uh, uh, written records that I could find or references I could find. But in uh, South America there are so many uh, of them in Peru and Chile area right, uh, which is uh, uh, possibly drier, uh, drier belt. Right. So uh, uh, toward, again uh, uh, you know, how it came to India uh, is still, uh, know, we pro probably like to believe that it has uh, come through the Persian uh, connections. Now let's uh, uh, try to just understand what the system is all about. So it is uh, nothing but a tunnel system which is below the ground, right? So it sometimes does cut the uh, water table. Right? So water table is nothing but the 
uh, what you call the line of water that is uh, you know, the saturated zone uh, uh, that we have below the uh, surface. So once you dig a well, the water level that you find in the well can be considered as the water table of that particular area. But so that's the easiest way to understand. So uh, here what they used to do in Iran is to, uh, you know, uh, if a community needed uh, water, it has to be brought from long distances, especially the, uh, the northern hills, the Elbrus mountains. So the slopes of Elbrus mountains were used to uh, draw water, especially the snow melt waters were diverted through these tunnel systems to villages. So they used to dig uh, uh, huge wells there, which uh, the initial wells are called the mother wells, right, which draws the water from uh, either from snow melt or from the subsurface uh, infiltration that happens into these, uh, into the uh, you know, sedimentary, sedimentary deposited soils or sedimentary uh, soil that is there. Uh, and this is then further carried to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, where you have, where you have a village or a settlement. So uh, to keep it maintained or uh, during the construction, what they do is that they keep on building uh, uh, air vents or uh, wells at equal interval. So most of these uh, air vents that you will find in Iran are round with maybe barely uh, enough space for uh, one person to go down. And uh, some of these uh, uh, air vents are much deeper. You will find uh, uh, some are nearly 200 to 300 feet uh, <laughs> deep. Right? Now, so this, uh, uh, the, uh, the few things one has to understand, you have the first well that is sunk, it is called the mother well. Right, uh, and uh, the tunnel that is uh, uh, dug is called uh, a channel tunnel or a Kanat gallery. So I'll be normally using the term Kanat gallery. And uh, you have uh, these vents uh, which are there connecting the, to the surface. These are called as air vents. And the exit is called the uh, Kanat Now, uh, so Some of the systems you will not find exit at all. Right, uh, because, because it uh, just goes, uh, uh, into, they, they just connect it to pipelines and extend it further. So, uh, only few places I have found a real mouth and uh, that is only in Bidar that we have been able to see a very, very clear cut uh, uh, mouth kind of a thing. Now, this is uh, the aerial view, right, where you will find, if you look into a satellite imagery of uh, Iran, you will find lots of uh, holes. <laughs> on this of a series of holes you will find leading to the city. So uh, there will be many lines of <coughs> canals that are connecting into a city uh, area as such. So huge uh, numbers of canals uh, exist in Iran. Now they are known by different names <laughs> in different countries. So uh, Iran you have uh, the normal common term that is used as Kanak. Uh, Iraq you will find the Kares is much common term than uh, kind of, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan and India it is called Karez or Kareez. Uh, now in Afghanistan another interesting thing is that it all started with uh, the Hindu Kush mountains. So Hindu Kush mountains you will find the southern side only receives rainfall. The northern side doesn't receive uh, much rainfall. So uh, and that also it receives during the summer season. So it was very important to transfer water from the southern side to the northern side where the entire land is. So they had dug up the mountain, Hindu Kush mountain, uh, to the other side. So you have so many channels uh, in the Hindu Kush mountains, which are, you know, which is now being used by uh, the, uh, the Taliban's and the others, <laughs> the Osamas, right, <laughs> who are there in uh, this particular area, and uh, the U.S. forces have been fighting them. Right. So you have uh, lots of them, Morocco, uh, Khitara, Ritara. You no, know, some of them are under the sand dunes. So very interestingly, still functional. That is, uh, you, you have uh, nearly most of the countries it has reached. <laughs> that is what you can find. Now in India, you have them uh, in uh, these six cities. Uh, except this, this is not a uh, city as such. This is still a uh, what do you call? Maybe a, a town like that. Very comparatively very smaller one. It is very close to Belgaum. But rest of them are uh, uh, cities with uh, uh, maybe population uh, uh, approximately to uh, 10 lakh, 10, one, uh, what do you call, 1 million, right? Mm -hmm. 1 million. Uh, Bidar, we consider it, is a, a, it will be the first one where uh, 
the uh, uh, connects were first constructed and then the rest followed. So this is in that sequence, uh, possible possible sequence because there are no historical records, uh, written records available, uh, no, when they started or who constructed them except for Ahmadnagar and Aurangabad. Ahmadnagar, Aurangabad and Burhanpur. We have very clear records who constructed them, when they were constructed and what was the purpose of construction. But the rest of them, we don't have a written uh, format or historical or even the chroniclers have not documented it. You know, some uh, uh, well-known uh, chronicler like the Farishta, uh, he talks about lots about intrigues and other things <laughs> uh, within the uh, courts, but uh, uh, he never talks about these water systems or facilities. So uh, uh, you have uh, these many systems and uh, two major cities which have a uh, lot of systems, 15 to <laughs> 16 systems. right? So these are all comparatively smaller systems when compared to those that are there in Iran. The longest one in Iran is uh, 80 kilometers, right? It is the Gonabad that are covered so that no one goes in, and it is uh, pro uh, no, it has a uh, dome-shaped structure, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, probably uh, used as a uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, so that no one understands what it is, or maybe someone. Uh, takes it as a uh, what you call mi misguidance is given uh, to the invaders probably so that they don't destroy the uh, water systems. So this is Bijapur, and uh, even some pipelines. This, this is one uh, destroyed pipeline. You can say uh, ruins. So the, the this pipeline is uh, the width of the pipeline is uh, somewhere around 16 inches. Right? <laughs> you can imagine huge. And this is just uh, one feet long and they are coupled together and then lime mortar is applied so uh, it is within the lime concrete and they have been taking it for kilometers together so sometimes uh, they need uh, to maintain the pressure of water so they build such kind of structure so you have pipes that are running like this inside right? and some of them are open on the top with uh, a uh, maybe, maybe a small cistern kind of a thing so that the uh, pressure is again built up and then it goes again to the next thing. Now this, the height of this is maintained with the height at the source so that the pressure uh, uh, level is same and then it is further uh, taken uh, to the city. Now these are the gallery, different galleries that we find in India. This is Ahmadnagar. Now Ahmadnagar and Aurangabad, the gallery is uh, something different to that of what we have in the rest of the places. Now here, what they have done is they have done open trenching because the uh, soil is, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you call the geology crumbles much faster because it is vesicular basalt. So, you know, it is uh, the uh, basalt that comes out uh, in a very powderish manner. So, you will find it comes out in flakes. So, uh, for that, what they have done is they have taken deep trenches, then they have put a uh, what you call roof over it and uh, covered it up. So, no one knows that there is a system that is uh, right below the <laughs> city. Both in Aurangabad and uh, uh, Aurangabad you will find that, Aurangabad and Ahmadnagar. In Burhanpur, uh, it's again alluvial soil because it is right on the edge of uh, uh, what you call it, Deccan Plateau as well as the alluvial fans of uh, Satpura. So a lot of sedimentary material there. So inside certain places where the uh, section uh, is likely to collapse, they have used bricks right burnt bricks uh, to bake bricks not normally so to uh, protect the entire structure now burhanpur the, there is a natural protection also that has come through is the uh, what you call uh, uh, lime calcium deposit that that happens naturally so uh, that that is providing uh, now much more strength to the uh, entire structure right? bijapur there are two systems one is open trenching has also happened and there is tunneling as well. Right? Now, Bidar and Burhanpur are same uh, uh, from the perspective of entire thing has been tunneled. There is no open trenching that has happened. And they, both of them are uh, fully based on uh, groundwater. Uh, both of them don't have any access to surface water as such. So coming to uh, the story of uh, uh, Bidar, so Bidar is only place uh, where you will find a Kanat mouth very uh, you know, clearly uh, visible. 
at uh, most of the other places you will not find a kanath mouth so he, this is the best place no uh, that is why we have been trying to press to develop this into a water museum so that uh, people can go see experience what a, a kanath is <coughs> so this is uh, bidar is uh, located in northern karnataka right this is karnataka state of india so you have northeastern district of bidar uh, sorry karnataka is bidar and uh, this is the uh, cultural landscape of Bidar. Right? So you have uh, so, some of these places, uh, Walt and uh, his team visited. So you have so much, you know, uh, what you call, uh, uh, beautiful history to, show, uh, to be showcased in uh, entire Bidar. And all of them are uh, small, small, small landscapes of uh, uh, significance within the entire uh, historical landscape of uh, uh, with their asset. Right? Some of them are really old. For example, this one, this uh, Maidar temple. There are 116 ponds, right, of which uh, only 10 are now visible. Right? Uh, uh, and it is considered that you have to take bath in every one of these ponds and you will be uh, achieving moksha. Right? This is. <laughs> So this is uh, the in Bidar, uh, the, this is the municipal boundary, the urban boundary. There are three systems that are there. Uh, two are within the city. Right? Uh, one, uh, it actually starts from the fort, fort area within the fort area and uh, flows into the, uh, uh, what you call, the public enclosure, from the royal enclosure to the public enclosure. And uh, there is one which is right outside the city which is supplying water to the moat. And one, uh, two, two to three villages outside the uh, city, which is uh, no some prominent villages like uh, the uh, Brahmin villages, Agraharas. So they had exclusive uh, pipeline supply from uh, the uh, one of the water systems too. Uh, so, so it's very interesting to note that uh, though it was Mohammedan rulers uh, who were ruling the city, they had provided exclusive water supply to uh, uh, Brahminical settlement. <laughs> that is very interesting. And uh, the system I am working on is uh, four miles uh, uh, north of uh, Bidar. Now this is a new place where they had uh, uh, tried to th uh, no, think and develop a new settlement. So that is why it is called Naubad, new settlement, new Abadi, that is what we call uh, in Hindi. So new settlement was being developed and the first thing that they were doing was to develop a water system. Right? So. <coughs> I'll just uh, take you through the uh, one of these water systems that is the, this is within the public enclosure. So this actually starts from inside the fort, right inside the royal enclosure. Inside the royal enclosure there is a lake. Uh, uh, that lake again has a history associated with the uh, formation or uh, establishment of Bidar itself. So it is said that Ahmad Shah Wali, when uh, he was on a uh, probably on a uh, trip to some uh, or maybe he was uh, having a war with someone else and while returning back entire his army was thirsty and wanted to find water so he ends up in Bidar uh, very near to the fort and uh, meets a shepherd and asks for uh, no, uh, to show him some water so um, uh, the shepherd uh, uh, no, uh, what you call uh, shows him the spring which is uh, which has been later on developed into uh, the uh, water system as such. Then uh, uh, he, the king likes the spot and he asked, he asked the shepherd, can you show us a place where we can have, uh, uh, what you call, uh, uh, build a settlement or a fort. So this uh, shepherd makes a deal with the, uh, what you call, the king, that uh, he has to have his village within the fort. That was one. Even now you will find the village within the fort. And secondly, the lake that he is planning to build can should have his name. So the name of the lake, even now it is called Bomkondeshara Lake. So <laughs> this is this is what the uh, what you call the folklore, you know, uh, mentions about this particular thing. And that that is the only folklore. Again, it is written in Marathi, not in Kannada, though it is uh, Karnataka. This folklore only has a mention of uh, the uh, Kannada systems having been having been built in uh, by the Bahmanis, especially Ahmad Shavali. So it very clearly says Ahmad Shah Wali builds Nahars, right, um, uh, during this particular period. So there is no other mention you will find in uh, this one. 
So now again, this within the city, it connects most of the important buildings and there were two uh, public fountains and these fountains were located in uh, uh, Usman Ganj market and the other one in uh, uh, what you call Mahabub Ganj market and it uh, went through one of the, uh, it had channels uh, connecting one of the largest madrasa or universities of at the time, the Mahmud Gavan uh, Madrasa. Right? <coughs> So this is a royal enclosure and this is the lake I am talking about. So the system runs like this and goes into the city area. And this second system which comes uh, nearly 6 kilometers away, uh, it actually feeds this moat which is triple moat and uh, this has a system wherein it uh, goes around, uh, you know, swings around the various uh, uh, triple moat and enters into the uh, fort area and fills up this tank. Right? Now interesting thing is, they can block this, right? but uh, this system which is running from the city uh, can never be uh, touched by the enemy. So the entire city has water supply even though, uh, they, no, they, even though they can be on a siege by outside forces and they had agriculture within this. Even within the fort, uh, public enclosure as well as the royal enclosure there was uh, ag uh, agriculture going on. So uh, self-sufficiency was uh, there as such. At least the royal families could survive. <laughs> right. So the, from here you have uh, pipelines running to uh, some of the uh, small, especially the Brahminical villages. So this is the cross section of uh, the Nawabad Kares. So interestingly, Nawabad Kares is uh, you no know, cutting the water table like uh, you no know, in, in the initial sections itself. So, so water table is high, probably it was much higher. So uh, this uh, place where they have uh, dug up this uh, tunnel system had a spring which is documented uh, in the history and uh, Farista also mentions about uh, seven springs and one of them, one of the spring is Aliyabad spring. So this is, uh, uh, this entire system has been dug at this particular location. So uh, I was checking how come this could happen that they so then I found, uh, you know, after checking lots of geology or studying geology, I found that this has been built right on a lineament, a fracture. So you have a continuous flow of water that is happening uh, uh, from this. So very interestingly, they, <laughs> they were able to do it right on a geologic fracture. Interesting thing is that it is running against the surface slope. So you'll find surface slope is on towards one side and the tunnel system runs towards the opposite side. Right. So the uh, way it has been constructed, uh, you have uh, both the uh, construction going on simultaneously, horizontal as well as vertical. So otherwise uh, it may not have been possible to complete it in a much faster manner and possibly each of these sections were done by different artisans. Right. So you will find the shapes are different and the size are different um, uh, in most of the sections. So uh, and uh, they always had, uh, uh, no, uh, they left their uh, uh, symbols inside. Right? Uh, possibly you will find some areas where the Bahmani arch has been um, you know, carved into uh, this flat, right? Uh, this one. Right. <coughs> so this is what I have been doing. So a lot of uh, activities going on. So initially when I ended up in 2012, I started mapping them because no one knew where it was, where it, where it started, where it, uh, uh, only uh, they had one huge tunnel to show me and they said it might be some escape route of then, uh, then times then uh, <laughs> and I, I took the courage to go in because you have uh, lots of bats inside, lots of uh, porcupines inside, snakes inside, right? so lots of things but there was no water as such, so it was dry. Uh, so uh, many people were afraid the certain sections had collapsed. Uh, then I started uh, going in. Uh, you know, every day it was a new exploration. I took two laborers with me, and I used to climb down with the help of a rope into these vents and uh, crawl down into these uh, <laughs> small spaces. So like that, I was able to map the entire uh, uh, water system. Uh, this one, because this is, uh, uh, I found that it is much more. Uh, what you call, uh, uh, we could rejuvenate it, uh, restore it and maybe provide water to the people because people were still using it for ir irrigation as well as for uh, as potable water. So, uh, 
So a lot of things. So I started stakeholder consultations. Uh, uh, I found that none of the people belong to be there who are living in this particular area, and they don't have any any understanding or interest to understand what the system is. Then uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, what you call uh, campaigns with them, uh, try to make them understand, and then the people started cooperating. Right? So uh, when people started cooperating, things started happening much more faster. Then I did some uh, uh, other studies which are. Uh, uh, what you call uh, related to hydrogeology and all. So the methodology followed is uh, has three main things. One is the cultural resources, land resources, socio-economics, and uh, the uh, policy side of it. How it can be addressed. So a lot of uh, uh, inputs going in to develop uh, a conservation plan. Uh, few character-defining elements. Uh, this is uh, one of the farmhouses which uh, Walt and his team visited as well. So this is somewhere, uh, uh, it actually shows the uh, cultural assimilation the entire region is having. So you'll find the uh, Mohammedan uh, arch that is there which is of Bahmani uh, times and you'll find uh, the symbols that are of uh, Hindu or the Hindu motives on the wood, right? the Kanapati, the uh, horns or maybe some other uh, uh, symbols that are there, Om etc. So th th there is an acceptance of uh, uh, different uh, cultural uh, scenarios. And uh, what you find here is the jaggery making units because sugarcane uh, probably came. So this shows that sugarcane probably came some 200 years ago to this particular area. So it is not that uh, <laughs> um, no, uh, uh, it came uh, very recently or uh, uh, it became much more faster the, or the, the spread was much more faster uh, uh, in the recent days because the cooperative industry, sugar industries became much more uh, uh, what you call efficient in this uh, southern part of India and uh, uh, again it is a much more cheaper crop to cultivate because you just need to plant it, water it, you need not do anything else, it will grow on its own, <laughs> just water is the only thing that is required. So these are some very interesting character defining elements, you have the footholds, right? so these are the footholds that I had to <laughs> climb down and uh, most of the time with just a a uh, single rope uh, protecting me, right? <laughs> so the initial conditions were like this. Most of the air vents were like this with uh, lots of trees growing, lots of bats inside, lots of uh, snakes, especially uh, you have vipers and uh, cobras, right? <laughs> and uh, no administrators in here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> and uh, inside, Inside part we found lots of things, you know, people used to dump waste because it is just an abandoned well. So if, even we found carcasses of animals lying there. And uh, uh, then we started the work, tried to educate people. Boat, so the <laughs> and uh, you have the social forestry program which is uh, all haywire. Uh, no, they don't have any idea of uh, the biogeographical zones of India. And they should they should have actually suggested something that is suitable for this area. But what they are doing is they are suggesting something that is uh, uh, no uh, plants that suck away the water, so like gly glycidia or eucalyptus, etc. So these have come from the uh, what you call the uh, age-old British system, wherein they you know use the uh, eucalyptus as a uh, uh, what you call plant to uh, do social forestry, and you know it actually supported their industries as well. So we did a lot of uh, uh, condition assessments in the initial phase so uh, to find out what the uh, condition of the entire tunnel system is and the vents are and uh, where and all debris is there, what is the level of the debris. So this was done uh, so that we have a very clear understanding of what is to be done in the future. We did uh, uh, the land use, uh, land use mapping and we find that uh, uh, the pink color area Right, uh, what you find is uh, expanding much faster. It is the urban, <laughs> uh, right, it is just outside the city, but uh, the land is much cheaper here, so uh, you have uh, more expansion that is happening. So, we did uh, study the geology, uh, the, uh, this is what I was talking about the uh, fracture zones within the laterite, because the laterite lies right above the basalt. So, which is uh, uh, 90 feet uh, of laterite, 60 to 90 feet of laterite, and then you have this very hard uh, basalt. So, because of which laterite becomes a very good uh, aquifer. Laterite is a highly porous rock, porous material. So, uh, uh, whatever you pour, it just 
seeps in much faster than uh, anything else. Right? <coughs> So we did a lot of studies on rainfall related issues and we find uh, August to September, uh, October that is a period where you get a uh, good amount of rainfall every year uh, in uh, Bidar. Uh, we identified the delineated actually, the uh, watersheds and then I started working on the watershed related uh, conservation plan. We were monitoring the uh, water table continuously uh, for I think I have uh, since 2012 I have been doing this so I know how much fluctuation uh, is happening now so this is from September 2015 so you'll find it's all dry so these these are places where even if you dig uh, 25 30 meters you'll not find water so uh, only one area where uh, uh, this is where we where you have this green shade it is around two meter at two meter the water is available that that's again a, a fracture zone so so, uh, with the help of uh, actually one slide that has gone below, right? Huh? So, with the help of that, we created this uh, geohydrology uh, maps, and uh, then further we got it into uh, what you call uh, identifying the recharge zones, right? So, those zones which can uh, help the system survive uh, for a, a longer duration. So, uh, three zones were identified. One is the forest zone, which is again. Uh, if, uh, under a bit uh, degraded condition because it is uh, entirely eucalyptus plantation there. The second zone is uh, much more protected because it is under the air force and uh, there is a buffer zone for uh, the airport it is required. So that area remains always uh, uh, open to agriculture. So that is good as such even if there is no vegetation and if there is agriculture the rainfall actually seeps in and it goes in. So there is a recharge of groundwater that is happening. The third zone is where a lot of pressure is happening, a right, lot of change, land use change is happening. So with, uh, that is where the entire uh, the mother well and the uh, few initial wells are located. So this is the place where we are trying to protect now. There is a new highway that, that is being planned <laughs> just right next to the uh, mother well. So this uh, uh, is, uh, we have given it to the local government so that uh, they can take actions on it. So I'll just go uh, take you through some of those photographs of uh, uh, restoration that we have been doing. So uh, this is the initial phase of restoration. So this is a, this is where this is a small tank where the entire water uh, from the Kanat system comes in, and uh, people take uh, uh, you know make use of it from here. So this is uh, so there is a small channel that runs uh, to the uh, mouth of the uh, Kanat from here. So uh, the cleaning process is on. So I uh, brought this person uh, from Kerala. So he is well known for uh, digging surangams. So this guy has done, though you are not going to get a 24 into 7 water supply, except for Bijapur which had during the, uh, what you call, 16th century, they had a pipeline supply <laughs> to some of, at least some of the individual houses. And uh, people, public uh, could get it from uh, fountains, the Ganj. So uh, from uh, what they call Begum Tala. So all these wells, uh, in around 50 of them I surveyed uh, during the September 2015. They got recharged and I have been continuing to monitor them. So uh, till now, uh, no, all of them have wells. So now they have, now people have, uh, no, what they call, uh, uh, people have become more enthusiastic and they are <laughs> coming forward. And they, they started understanding that, okay, uh, revival of the system can help them. Two major issues, uh, one is the urbanization because there is no control uh, on what is happening on the ground and second is uh, uh, sanitation, you know, uh, Walt and the team knows how difficult it was to walk through some of the uh, lanes uh, within this. So this, uh, uh, on one side there are few NGOs that have come forward and who are helping now. Uh, so solid waste management, uh, you know, the, how door to door collection is happening. Segregation is happening, some little bit of uh, what you call uh, composting is also happening, but there is no, uh, we have not been able to find a solution for the water, wastewater related issue. So the um, uh, municipal body has a STP or the solid waste, uh, sorry, uh, sewage treatment plant, but th there is no uh, connecting line to it. So they, <laughs> they have built one STP, but uh, the system to take 
uh, water to that or waste water to that particular system is not there. So that's the situation that we are in. There are protection laws, several of them. None of them is applied on the ground. So uh, you know you have uh, uh, st no still issues. I have been working with uh, this uh, town planning department. So I uh, have been able to uh, do a little bit of impact. So I have uh, uh, at least the watershed area, the demarcation boundary for the snowboard carriers has been now accommodated into their master plan as a protected area. But, uh, and they have uh, put it very specifically, no built zone. So that uh, no more conversion of land from agriculture to urban has to happen. But still you will find some now, corruption related issues are still there, so you'll find some changes happening. I'll just take you, this is, uh, uh, so this trip of mine led to, uh, led me to do this. So, uh, possibly in the next two months, uh, I'll bring this out and uh, maybe uh, you'll, you'll all have this. So, I'll take you to a, a small video and uh, I'll uh, stop, stop this entire presentation. So, this is uh, a video that was uh, done by uh, BBC during 2017. I don't know where it is. Okay. 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 I have pictures if people want to see. Uh, please do not share them. <laughs> 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 you promise so you can see these lamp uh, holders. And uh, the gallery has been constructed in a V-shape. Uh, so that it is, uh, let's not This is uh, a, a system which uh, uh, actually draws groundwater. There are series of wells that are dug, and these wells are connected with the help of a tunnel. So uh, the main well, which we call as the mother well, is dug at a place where there is good enough water, that is good source of water is there. And then it is taken to place where you want to create a settlement, or maybe you already have a settlement. This tunnel was carved out of the rock 600 years ago by Persian engineers and Indian workmen using nothing more than pickaxes and shovels. Now the water is flowing again since the channel has been restored and eventually when it rains, the level of water should come up to somewhere right up here over my head, supplying the needs of the community who live around here. So all my mapping, uh, etc. I did using uh, normal mobile uh, map of mapping applications. Uh, I might have surveyed around 800 odd wells, right, uh, climbing up and down uh, and them, most of them, to find out which one has a, a tunnel and which one does not have it. <laughs> around uh, uh, 50 odd wells in the surrounding area, they started having water, right, and none of them have dried till late. That is, this is May now, right, and it is still having good lot of water. So that shows that, uh, you know, these traditional systems can